This is a podcast interview with former state lottery director Terry Rich. He led a team that cracked the largest lottery fraud in history. He has given away an astonishing one billion. Now you're going to want to listen to the end of this interview where we even got to discuss what goes on behind the scenes and his advice if you play the lottery. Without further ado, let's get to it now. Here is my podcast interview with former lottery director Terry Rich. Rich. So I'm here with Terry Rich, who has given away $1 billion as a former state lottery director. He's the author of two books, The 80 Billion Gamble and Dare to Dream, Dare to Act, and plenty of other things. He's been on national television. He actually led a team that busted the largest lottery fraud in U.S. history. I'm so excited to welcome Terry Rich to the program. Terry, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, it sounds kind of fun and big, but uh, just like any other business, it's a day-to-day operation. So anxious to to have the discussion. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. So you are a former state lottery director and you've given away a billion dollars, which to most people is just a staggering amount of money. What does it feel like to, to give away the these massive prizes, millions of dollars to people that win the lottery, because, you know, I've been on the receiving end, but, and I've met plenty of other lottery winners who have been on the receiving end, but to give it away, I mean, what is that like? Um, I guess the best part is the money wasn't mine anyway. It was uh, the people who played the lottery. So it felt rewarding that, uh, you know, we had winners and we could give away winners. So that's over 10 years and that's in a relatively small state. Uh, you know, you can imagine what in New York and California, if a director is there for 10 years, uh, uh, how many total dollars would be multi-billion dollars that are given away. Right. The amazing thing most people don't realize, the lottery business is a big business. If you think about music, it's about $10 billion a year in sales. Uh, movies, about the same, 10 to 12. Sporting tickets, $20, $25 billion. You add it all together. All of those together still don't add up to the amount of money that uh, the lotteries give away. My time when I left, it was $80 billion a year. And uh, Mm -hmm. today it's around $98 billion a year. So it's a huge business. People love the game. And remember, there are four or five states that still don't have lotteries. So uh, a lot of money changes hands over the time. And it definitely is a big business run by each state. Winners that you meet that win these major prizes, how do they typically react? You know, it's. I figured that those who have never handled money before probably are going to be in a different situation and probably not handle it. You hear a lot of the negative stories of people who have won and, and had, but uh, you got to realize no one, to my knowledge, has ever been assaulted or killed by someone else they didn't know after winning the lottery. Usually when you hear the bad stories, Jack Whitaker and some of the others, hmm. they're people, family members that get jealous and, and, and assault, kill that sort of thing. But most people, when they come in, uh, you know, we give them advice. Now, the smaller jackpots, people who play the scratch tickets, they, they're they in for smaller jackpots, smaller winnings. And it's kind of like working the slot machine. They, they like to win. They like to win small. They continue to play. The people that dream that play less often are the people who go after the big jackpots, the mega millions, the Powerballs, other lotto games that, that are out there. And, you know, those are those are completely different styles of winners. And when you really win a big jackpot, we always gave two or three pieces of advice. And I always ask winners like you when they came back, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What could we do better to help you with? And most of them said, I'm glad those that still had money. I'm glad I got an accountant. I'm glad I got a lawyer. Uh, And that seems like if you didn't have money for you don't spend money, that big money on those. But they'll help you keep the money. Uh, because you may want to put it in a trust or do something different so that you have less taxes that you have to pay to the state. And the other is, which was probably the best advice, is I wish I'd have waited 30 days before I spent any of the money. I wish instead of the red Lamborghini, I might have wanted a green one. Uh, but you get excited in the in the scheme of things. And when you walk away, uh, it's 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 pretty pretty scary in its own way if you all of a sudden got all this money and everybody's bugging you. Uh, the other thing we suggest is, to get a third party, again, that lawyer, accountant, or mm. someone else who will handle all the big requests because you're going to get requests and it, because your name is public. And I'm a big believer, uh, after the Eddie Tipton case, that mm. states should 
give people's names out who win because in our state, people sell farms for $10 million, $20, $30 million, mm -hmm. and it's always public. So I think it's important for the integrity of the game that, that you give the name out. But when your name's out there, uh, I mm -hmm. think it's important to do a press conference immediately. Uh, that way, people aren't bugging you saying, well, wait a minute, something's screwy. How come you don't want to talk? That's where they get it out and say, I did my interviews. I'm done. Now I'm going to go live my peace with my money. Um, and, and the second is to have somebody... When you do get requests, if my child is 10 years old, has cancer, is going to die, I need some money, can't you help me, or I'm going to lose my house, that they screen all of those. And right at the beginning, you say, here are my charities that I want to give to, and I'm not giving to anything else. Please handle these requests, because you'll get tugged at the heartstring. You shouldn't feel guilty when you win the lottery. You should enjoy it. And as a lottery, we never really tried to contact and try to use people who won the lottery back in, because... We didn't want to bug them. You want it? You want it fair square? It's yours, and you should enjoy it. So that's kind of a long answer to your question there, Timothy. So first of all, for people that, that aren't familiar that are watching or listening to this, it's the state of Iowa in the United States where, where you were, were the lottery director for, for quite a few years. And do most winners, from your experience, have people that, that come out of the woodwork? I, I did back in the day. Um, People came out of the woodwork initially, especially after I, I just won. But does that happen to the average person, or, or do you know? Well, it depends on the amount. I mean, he, he, all the winners over six hundred dollars in our state, anyway, in many states, some of them it's a thousand, have to be disclosed, have to be printed on our website and be public. Mm -hmm. So when people see that, then you'll get uh, financial people. I'll help you invest that money, and you'll get all that. That's why. You have some time when you have a big win over 600 bucks to talk to someone first so that when they call, you can simply say, hey, it's handled. Sorry, thanks. But if you don't know what you're doing and people call you, everybody's going to sound good to you, right? So you get really confused. and You don't want to be confused. You just want to enjoy your money and figure out a way of how it can be life-changing to help you out. And, and would you recommend that if someone wins the lottery, a major prize, say, over a over million dollars, should they – in your opinion, get a financial advisor and, 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 a, and a state attorney and experts to help them prior to turning in the ticket? Or Absolutely. And, and here's the reason why. Um, when you win the lottery, say you win a million bucks, there are two or three ways you get that million, right? One is called the annuity, and that's how Powerball Mega Millions and the others work. You can get annuity or you can get cash value. So when you walk in, you may think, I get a check for a million and I get to spend it all. Well, First off, if you get it cash, in cash, the lotteries will take a portion of that, usually 25% on an average anyway in our state, 25% immediately we take out and send to the federal government, and 5% goes to the state government. So you're not going to get a million dollars. You're going to get 30% less, which is $700,000 in cash. And you still probably will owe more money. We uh, The laws and states vary on what they take out, but the reason they do that is because they don't want you taking off for Mexico or Europe and never getting any of that money as ordinary income. So we take some out, but depending on your on your on your taxable income, if you make a lot of money or you don't make any money or you have a lot of write-offs, the following April, when your tax accountant, that's the way you want to get a tax accountant, needs to estimate how much more taxes or how much money you might return if you don't if you have a lot of write-offs. Uh, and you're able to do so you have some time to really invest it, give away the money to a charity, all those sort of things, which you're trying to keep as much as you can. You won't give any more to the government than you have to. Right. So that's why the tax attorney is so valuable in the early portion, because you'll have a little time to give to charity, figure out if you want to write off some something, if you've got businesses and maximize the total amount of dollars that you have. So that's why we recommend right away to get get a tax attorney for sure. And then a lawyer in case you want to set up a, some sort of an account for your kids for college and that sort of thing. Those are real complicated things that most people haven't had to deal with in one lump sum. And you really want to do it. You might want to take it instead of going in and claiming the ticket on December 28th, or you might want to wait until January 3rd, and then you'd have a whole year to figure it out and keep that money and have it on interest for a year too. So it is pretty complicated when you win that big jackpot. When the prizes nowadays, the major, the jackpots, the the they balloon to a, a size that's much larger than it did 
when I won in 1999, although I'm, you know, incredibly grateful about that. But now they get up to hundreds, hundreds, you know, there was just a, a prize worth $2 billion that someone just won in, in California, I believe, but they get to be, there's this a couple of reasons for that. So remind me to say, you know, we can talk about, should you take it in cash? Should you take it in annuitized value? The monies that you hear, when you hear it, you can find out if it's annuitized, but th what that means is, when you pay $2 for a Powerball ticket, $1 automatically goes to the jackpot. So that $1 mm -hmm. is going to be split amongst everybody who wins uh, when, when they win. Mm -hmm. And so when we advertise those jackpots, we didn't say, the ca we, you kind of see underneath cash value is this much, but you'll hear the word annuitized. One of the reasons the jackpots grow so fast today that they didn't five years ago is the interest rate was what, 1%, half a percent that you could get because the lotteries buy very conservative uh, annuitized values because they want the money to be there. They want to do a risky uh, venture to buy something that would be a high interest rate, but it could go under. It isn't going to go under. It's government bonds. Hmm. So that really took off because what happened? Well, inflation hit, and all of a sudden now hmm. you got a 4%, 5% return you can get on those annuitized uh, dollars. When you put $100 in, you can get a much higher return over 30 years. So the jackpots grew faster in, in, in that case, and that's why, why they're bigger. The cash value was really not the same. It was higher, but not as big a growth as you might have thought if this would have happened five years ago. But as marketers, I was a marketer, as marketers, we always looked and said, hey, you know, the higher amount you can do it. Now, what happens then on top of that is when you won, yours was a huge amount in 1999. We'd had a million dollar jackpots in those days. Everybody would run to the store. Now it seems like it's four, five, six hundred million before anybody starts thinking about it that are the occasional players. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you get this jackpot fatigue now that you've had two billion dollars. When will the press get excited about the next jackpot? And so that was one of the dilemmas the lotteries had. Hmm. So to fix that 10 years ago. Remember 2008 when you have all the bad in, um, economy, you had a not a depression, a recession? Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, and when you won yours in 1999, there were two different games operating in two different sets of states. Powerball began back in the 1980s, 1990s, and because small states couldn't have big jackpots. So when you put your money in, you don't have a big enough population to get to that million dollars. Well, if you have two or three states putting the money in, remember when you when you buy the $2 ticket, half of it goes into the jackpot or into the total price funds. All of a sudden, uh, now they could have a million dollar and everybody's excited to play Powerball. Well, a New York came in or a Michigan or a, you know, a big state, California, said, well, we'd like to play this Powerball. And the directors at the time, because lotteries are run by directors who formed a consortium called the multi-state lottery. Um, they said, no, we don't want you in. And so they said, we'll start our own. And they started mega millions. So about six or seven of the big states had mega millions going, which was pretty much exactly what Powerball was, but you couldn't buy mega millions in a Powerball state and you couldn't buy Powerball in a mega million state. Well, in 2008, all of the states were saying, we got to have more money. Who's who can get us more money? How about the lottery? What could you do? So the directors were pressured to bring more money in. So we said, why don't we merge together and both of us sell Powerball and Mega Millions? Well, we didn't get the merger done, but we did a cross-sell agreement so that Powerball states could sell Mega Millions and Mega could sell Powerball. And immediately we were selling more and bringing more money in. And then we thought, well, these two games are pretty much identical. One's played on Tuesday and Friday and the other's played on Wednesday and Saturday. Why don't we increase one of them to $2. Now, if you were to do that with uh, toothpaste and say, we're going to double the price and give you the same ticket, you'd probably say, you got to be crazy. No, you know, you're going to lose money on that deal. Well, people like to gamble. And in fact, the opposite happened when it went to $2. Now, instead of 50 cents going into each time you have it into the prize, you got a dollar going in. You don't have to sell as many tickets. Lo and behold, 25% less people bought tickets but that meant we had an increase of 25% for the jackpots. And that's when we had that first billion and a half jackpot right out of the chute. And so, you know, that those are that's a kind of a technical way. But that's the reason the jackpots grew quickly. And I think, you know, if I were sitting in the meetings today, and I'm not, 
Uh, but if I were, you know, the discussion would be, what are we going to do now that we had a $2 billion jackpot? Because people are saying, well, why are you giving away to one person? Why not divide that up into a whole bunch of million dollar jackpots? That answer is pretty simple. Nobody buys it when it's just a million dollars. Uh, people get excited when the media talk about it and it gets up to two billion. So the states actually make more money, not just the lotteries, but if a lottery makes it, the good causes that the monies go to in profits all go back to the state. They're making a lot more money now. Remember, I told you it was eighty billion. When I was there in in sales. It's now ninety eight billion dollars. Those increases came from people winning and those big jackpots growing. That is so. That is so interesting. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is is it also a factor that they added more numbers to the game a few years ago? To good question. So when you when lotteries are designed, um, let's let's take small state of Iowa, three million people. So three million people can play, and you're playing a Powerball game, and they're doing it. Um, you have the odds of winning. So if, if let's say we have three million people, if we did three million ball combinations we could theoretically have winners quite a bit. So you want to try to balance and the smart folks at the multi-state lottery and the, and as the folks who've been around the lottery for a while, do all those algorithms to design it, the vendors, you try to make it so that you get winners at certain points, right? What the odds are uh, determine the winners and the number of people playing. So right now I think it's around 300 million to one, you win the Powerball. And so now that everybody can play and there are 300 million people across the U.S., if I remember right, that's like if everybody would buy uh, uh, one ticket um, with that $1 in, then, yeah, you, you, you could theoretically always have a winner. But you play this game, you can't buy that many tickets because you got to go to the store every two days to buy it. And that's a lot of tickets to buy cranking out. And, and so that, that makes it so that that's how you try to balance that out. So the more people you have playing, you got to have the odds higher because you're going to have more of a chance to win. Otherwise you'd have a winner on every draw. And they did the same thing. I mean, this, we've had two or three, they call them matrixes where you add more white balls or you add more red balls. Um, the dilemma in Powerball Scratch tickets, you try to have a lot of smaller winners, right? But in Powerball, you try to get the big jackpot going because that's when people buy it. So it used to be people would win more $2, $4, you know, $8, more smaller tickets. Today, the odds, the way they're set up, allow less winners so that we have the big jackpots. Otherwise, you could give away a lot more smaller winners. And that's how, kind of the balance of when you put balls in or take balls out uh, will get you how how many, what the estimate will be based on all the odds and, and the smart folks in math to, to try to always have winners around because if people can't win, they don't like to play. But, you know, that, that's been adjusted two or three times and has been very effective and very, very successful for the lotteries in the States. Yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense. With this recent win, this Powerball win, massive win, $2 billion, over $2 billion in the state of California, a single ticket that, that had the winning numbers. So the drawing did not happen on time. And there was this huge anticipation. Everyone was really, really on pins and needles waiting for the balls to, to come out to see if they had won, but it didn't happen. There was a delay. And then it happened the following morning, but there, there's a huge controversy and there, there are these conspiracy theories about, about what happened, but what's, what's your opinion on that? Well, let me preface by saying that I was involved uh, with one of the largest lottery frauds in U.S. history and what happened. Uh, and I'm completely confident in what happened on this draw and what, and the reasons why. Let's see if I can explain it in general without giving away any, any security uh, features, because there's so much security that happens on a Powerball draw, different than the one I was involved with. It's amazing to me the, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of draws that happen in a given year of lotteries across the world. And very little, if any, fraud has in the past has occurred. And that was, the, that was some of the rumors that were going around that I was hearing. But I, I had confidence in it, knowing all of the things behind the scenes and actually cracking a fraud from before. And here's why. Each time that there's a lotto draw, now we're, lotteries are different. Lotto draws are different. Powerball, Mega Man are different than scratch tickets. Um, each state runs their own lottery. Each state designs their own tickets. 
So this conglomeration we talked about earlier, where every time you buy a ticket for $2, $1 goes off to this unit called multi-state lottery, which all of the states participate in, all the state's directors are board of directors on, to divvy the money out after the winnings are, are uh, obtained. So when a Powerball draw is done, there are, well, let's, let's go back to the point of you're buying your Powerball ticket. When you buy the Powerball ticket, immediately all of this security information, what you bought, where you are, and you're probably on camera, audio and video at the time, all go separately to two different computers run by two different organizations, one of those being the lottery and then an outside vendor organization. Hmm. So every day at a certain time, they do what's called a cutoff, just like you do at the end of the month when you do your financials. And one of those say, one of the, that one group says, well, this is how many tickets were sold and how many dollars, and these are the combinations. We've got all that locked up in this one file. And over here, the lottery does the same thing. And they both send those. They can't talk to each other. They both send those to a third-party place. And if the light is green, it means those two numbers matched. And lo and behold, I was ready to go. We can do the draw. Because you don't want to do the draw until you know that both there's two separate files with the numbers uh, so that you can verify immediately how many winners you have. If you just had one or say it was off and that one that was off by three draws, one of those draws won, you'd be in big trouble. That would be like a fraud. So it's a great, great security feature that each state lottery has. But you've got to do that in every one of the 46 to 48 states that have and sell Powerball. Now, normally when there's a regular jackpot, the computer functions work absolutely great. Within 15 or 20 minutes, everybody has synced them up, say, yep, they match. We're ready to draw. California's ready to draw. And there's this big wall of everything's green. So we now have those locked down and we know the numbers that have been drawn. Now we can do the random number draw with the balls and all the security features that are in those where they flip coins. They've got all these different sets of balls and different machines and accountants and everything else. So everything's set. We go ahead and draw. So that usually takes 15 to 20 minutes. So by nine o'clock, everybody's cut off. And then they, you know, when I say nine o'clock, I'm talking central time. So let's mm -hmm. say 10 o'clock Eastern and 11 o'clock when they do the draw in Florida, everything's locked down. They do the draw and now they go back out and do the exact same things. Okay. This computer says we have this many winners. This computer says we have this many winners. We rep they report it back to the multi-state lottery. It's announced whether, it's, and that's all done within one or two hours. By the time you wake up, you can check your tickets. It's already reloaded back to the computer to see who the winners are. You can go in and check your ticket. You can get your money and you're out. Well, in this case, when it's a huge jackpot, you don't anticipate billions of dollars at the jackpot. Now you have multi tens, hundreds of millions of tickets that are processed through these computers. And all of a sudden, you have a state who's got everything processed. It takes a lot longer to process those. And if they don't match, you've got one state that's red. We can't do the draw. And that's exactly what happened. And at that point, when they can't do the draw, all the sec uh, security for that state comes in, locks everything down, makes sure that these two people can't talk because you got to get the accountants to figure out. And if you think about if you're if you're a computer geek, uh, you realize that if you have two sets of data... All you got to do is just cross-reference those and see where they don't match. So all of these match, but here are five data points that didn't match. And so the accountants and the security officers then are saying, okay, what happened here? And they have to go through those and figure out why they didn't match and where they're at. So I I, I am not an expert. I, I cannot say exactly what happened in the one state that didn't because they said it was one state that didn't match. But that's exactly the process they were in. And so it takes a long time when you got millions of draws, especially in this one. It's bigger than they've ever had to do. So it's a brand new effort in trying to process everything to get it to match. But you don't want to draw until those match. And then once they put the put the numbers in and they got figured out where the problems were and they did the match, boom, lo and behold, um, they can draw and they drew it the next morning. So that's exactly the process you want. And that, that actually happens more often than you think because when they don't match, it's usually 12 midnight, one, two, three in the morning, and everybody and every one of the 46 to 48 lotteries stick around till they see the numbers and they see the draw because they've got to go back in and download. Okay, here are the numbers that were drawn. How many winners do you have over here and how many winners do you have over here? Put it back up into that central. Did it match? Yeah, it did. 
Perfect. Let's go ahead and download it. And now you can go in and claim your prize. So it is an amazing security process that happens. And uh, I'm, I'm really comfortable. I wasn't, you know, I'm not there anymore, but I'm really comfortable that, you know, that of all the procedures and processes they have, it worked exactly as it should have. Hmm. Yeah. Maintain the integrity of the game. It's yeah. And, and most people, I think, understand that there are some, some comments I get from people that, that are, you know, of course, skeptical that, that think the lottery is a scam, but what, what would you tell them? Uh, I would say that anytime you're dealing with money and big money, and by the way, I I saw the state that was having the problem that was in the press. It wasn't the same state that won the big jackpot. So that that one tells you something. Second, I can play now that I'm I'm uh, not a lottery director. I can I can play the lottery. Uh, I won four dollars three draws ago. I didn't win anything on that on that last draw. Uh, but I'm. I'm absolutely uh, very, this is a lot better, let me tell you, to have the states run it because you can go to the lottery office in your state, you can go to the governor in your state and say, I don't think this is good, and there'll be an investigation. If you're playing poker in Malta, mm-hmm. you, you, uh, you have no idea what they're doing, how they're doing, or the organized crime numbers that, that have been going on for years and why lotteries actually took it over for their state to run it. So I, I, I feel really good. And anytime there's money, I, I'm trying to think of all of the, you know, people say, well, you know, should this be the fraud that happened that that was a multi-state fraud in the lottery back in, in 2010 was a computer that drew the balls. And the gentleman who programmed the computer was the one that put in the, you know, the, the checks and balances weren't in place. And obviously they are now uh, uh, on that game. I, c- I can only count on one hand the number of lottery frauds in the U.S. I can't even, you know, it's even down to the big one, um, other than the one we had was the one in Pennsylvania and where... The draw officer and uh, and one of the accountants, I believe, put paint in a paint in a ping pong balls and swished them around so they were heavier than the others. So they bought all the twos and fours where they didn't have paint, and then and got well. That's a checks and balance. All they have to do is just get other people who look at the balls before they put it in there. They didn't have that that procedure. The other one was I'm trying to think where where the, the other one was in Milan, I believe, where they had nephews and nieces drawing the balls and and they'd blindfold them but they would heat the balls or they would cool them down. I mean, there's all sorts of ways. So whether it's balls, whether it's that, the point is there will always be somebody trying to beat the system, right, if there's money involved in any business that you're in. But the lotteries have so many checks and balances, and it really got sharpened up with, uh, with the hot lotto fraud that we were involved with uh, that I, I feel real comfortable in the procedures that we have based on what I know. In fact, every time we got on, we told people we were going to bust this, and we sent a guy to prison for up to 25 years. We sold more tickets because I think people realize if you're going to gamble, and people love to gamble, uh, I'm going to do it somewhere where they're watching. And uh, I, I know that lotteries are watching. Hmm. Now, you led a team that cracked the largest lottery fraud in history. You've also written a book, The $80 Billion Gamble and Dare to Dream, Dare to Act. But so for people that aren't familiar, what, what was this lottery fraud that you led this team to, to help crack, and, and how did that happen? Lotteries uh, have a lot of different games, and the lotto games have been uh, historically the only games that states get together. And you get together because you need a larger base to get the big million-dollar, billion-dollar jackpots that go on. So there was a game uh, developed, I think, in the late 1990s. Uh, it was called Hot Lotto. It played a lot like Powerball, but it was just 11 or 12 smaller states just to get another version of that same type of, of Powerball game, but gave away, you know, I guess more prizes. Jackpots were anywhere from a million to $5 million, but that's a big deal in, in the smaller states that this was in. So about 17 states were involved in it. A gentleman who worked for the organization, we talked about the organization that takes the money and, and gives it, you know, once the money comes in, we figure out who won and splits it back out to, pay, to make sure everybody gets paid, uh, hired, a, ha- hired a guy as the head of security. And he also, um, as, he, as he came in, looked, he kind of said, you know, why don't we do these games by computer versus by balls? Because the Powerball was the balls that you see today mm-hmm. in Powerball. Mm-hmm. Um, but he said it'd be a lot easier, you know, we're, 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 all the time and effort it takes to do the draws with the balls. We could just hit it and do a random number generator. And so the board said, okay, let's try it with a hot lotto. We don't want to do it with Powerball. That's, our, that's been working well. We, we don't do it with Powerball. But long story short, he 
arranged the computer and put in a code that allowed him to predict within 200 combinations what the winning numbers were. Hmm. And uh, he, he sent computers out to states. Many of us have in-state games. Colorado had one. Iowa had one. In-state games that are only played in that state. He sent them computers that also had this code on. And uh, in two years after he developed it, it was going well, lo and behold, there was a winner in Colorado, which was the first one that he tried it on. And it was a weird combination because he made it complicated enough. It could only happen on one of three given dates. It had to happen on a Wednesday and Friday. It had to happen between after 8 p.m. Central Time, and it had to happen on one of his computers. Then he could give his brother once a year is how this always came out. Once a year in any one of these computers, he could predict within 200 combinations the, the numbers. And so he gave those 200 combinations to his brother, who gave it to a friend who then went to Colorado, and lo and behold, instead of winning all the jackpot, by chance, he only won one-third of it, but it was a pretty good chunk of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. So he and, and the guy who bought it and the brother split it, gave some to Eddie. Tipton was the guy's name. And mm. well, a couple of years later, thought, you know, my friend's in trouble. Um, let's try this again. Went to Wisconsin and won six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. And mm. lo and behold, got by with it. He's was building a new house, things were going strong. And then, as people do when they create fraud, he got he felt uh, the need or the empowered to go for the big one and went after this game called Hot Lotto, which was drawn for 17 states. It was about 16.5 annuitized, about $10 million cash. Hmm. And the numbers won. He gave it to his friend to buy in Wisconsin, and his name Robert Rhodes. And and uh, when Robert Rhodes won it and they started talking about how we're going to win this, they decided to give it to Robert Rhodes' lawyer who gave it to a lawyer in New York or gave it to a lawyer in Canada. And it took about 11 months because you have a year to claim in most states. The ticket ended up in the hands of a guy in Canada, a lawyer, who called us and said, hey, uh, I won. And we'd been barking all summer. Everybody, we had a lot of people come in and said, I think the clerk stole my ticket or I think this or I think, you know, there's. It's mafia, you know, the lady said, because my husband's a truck driver, I haven't seen him, and, and they he, he must have won. I want half the money if he, he comes in. I want you to know about it. So we had all these people trying to falsely claim it. But no, when you buy a lottery ticket, you're probably on camera, and maybe your voice is also recorded. And mm. uh, this guy called and said, I'm just going to send you the ticket. You send me the money. Ding, ding, ding. No, we need to know who bought the ticket. Well, I bought it, blah, blah, blah. And then he called back a couple of days later saying, I told a little fib, I didn't buy it. That created the fraud for us to get the Department of Criminal Investigation and uh, and our attorney general's office. And it took two or three years to finally get him and the lawyer in New York that he got the ticket from to talk. Ultimately, the lawyer in New York tried to claim it after this guy did, the day that it was going to expire. And we wouldn't give it to him. So three weeks of negotiations, he just gave it up and said, I'll withdraw my claim. And uh, so we, the money we distributed back to all the states and everybody gave it back out because it's the winners, the people who play the lottery that should get it. So everybody gave it away. So not much happened until they finally got a hold of the guy in Canada and New York to say, you want to be the witness or you want to be the defendant? They both said, we'll be the, we'll be the witness. We don't want to go to jail. Here's the person we got it from in Houston, Texas. And lo and behold, about the same time, we released the the video of the person winning, and people started calling and said, that's Eddie Tipton. And he was a guy that was the security officer for the multi-state lottery who programmed the computer. And um, hmm. again, as directors, we oversaw Eddie, uh, but not enough checks and balances. He wrote the, he wrote the code, he compiled the code, he, he oversaw the code, and lo and behold... Uh, he stole it. I mean, you can blame a lot of folks, but it's Eddie that decided to try to do this this fraud. So uh, we we got him in, had a talk with him, and ultimately couldn't figure out how it actually worked uh, uh, until Wisconsin had an old computer that Eddie hadn't had a chance to wipe, and we found mm -hmm. the code, and he got sentenced up to 25 years. He's a felon. Um, his good friend got probation. He's the one that flipped first for us once we figured out what the code was. And his brother got 52 days and uh, they have to pay restitution. Iowa received no money because we didn't, we never paid the jackpot because we, we kept pushing it saying we're going to figure out because the game needs to be fair and honest. And, you know, their friends in Indiana to Colorado to all, you know, 
quite a few across the U.S. said, yeah, we got to figure this out, and we spent the money to do it, and lo and behold, you know, we call it an $80 billion gamble because obviously this little state, by saying that something happened, people could have got scared and not played in other states. And, you know, when you got $80 billion coming in, you mess it up. People say, well, I'm not going to play that. Uh, that's a bad deal. But obviously now that they're at $98 billion, it didn't affect it much. In fact, it may have helped people know that the game's going to be fair and honest. Mm-hmm. That's a long story there for you, but that's that's in a nutshell. And we did that with uh, the ticket, obviously – has so much security on it. Uh, you know, in the old days, people tried to cut and paste the scratch tickets. Mm-hmm. There's no way today to to cause that kind of fraud as a player, but um, we just, you know, we, we need to make sure that it's fair and honest. And then uh, when Eddie's brother got on the stand and said, that's not my brother, he that person's eating hot dogs. My, my brother don't eat hot dogs because he bought two hot dogs and he bought his ticket. That everybody looked at Eddie and said, he's waiting, he's three or 400 pounds. What do you mean he doesn't eat hot dogs? And it got in an Associated Press report, and then that's how we cracked it nationwide. By It appeared in the brother's uh, newspaper, and an FBI agent said, that's the guy that I tried to bust for money laundering. He told me he won the Colorado lottery. Remember, back to Colorado. So they called us. We started checking. And if you're ever going to do a fraud, know that they're going to check your cell phone. They're going to check all your social media sites and get all the names. They got all the names compiled. They called us and get, uh, ask other lotteries for all winners 600 and above. So we did and immediately found five connections just like that. And that that's that's how we busted it nationwide. So that's how a lotto ticket, two hot dogs, and Bigfoot solved the largest lottery fraud in U.S. history. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm so glad that you guys were successful in, in solving that. That That is really, really crazy. But you when know. you think of crime, here's here's the problem with crime. If it's a rape, it's a murder it's an assault um you know if you somebody gets charged they uh it could take forever they can appeal it all the way to supreme court and you keep thinking you know was it me and you feel like the victim yet you feel like did i cause this because it happened uh in this case the case was so well prosecuted that all three confessed and were sentenced so we know what happened they confessed they said we got all the jackpots we found everything that they did and that we actually that's how they actually did it so that we got closure and few people get closure. And so it kind of indicated that the seven or eight years that it took to do it uh, was worth it, especially knowing that uh, the lottery sales continue to increase because people have faith that the lottery is right. Just like the, what happened in this last big Powerball draw. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned that now he, now Eddie Tipton is serving 25 years, I believe. Are you able to say how he reacted when you first questioned him? Eddie got up to 25 years in prison. He was served at Clorinda, and after five years, an Iowa law with good behavior, he was let out. You know, it wasn't a murder. It was in the middle of COVID, so they were doing a lot of parole. So Eddie's out now and back in Texas. Uh, He still, uh, I think if he would do something else, would go back immediately. He still has to pay restitution or he goes back to prison in in Wisconsin. But I've done a lot of research since this time because, I mean, it's tough when you're a public official. It's a lot. It would have been a lot easier. And some suggested just pay it. You know, you're messing with dollars that should go to states for good causes. And that's a real ethical dilemma as a public official. If it's been a lot easier not to do anything, not to go out. My background's media and I'd get on and 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 say, you know, gosh, we got to find this just to get leads all we could. But you know, some would say that was that the right or the wrong decision. I guess with the closure we got, it's probably a good one. But here's the research as I looked at it. If you mm-hmm. if you think about in your local organizations, church, uh, school, uh, you if you have one person writing the purchase orders and one person writing the writing the checks, you're pretty ripe for fraud. The National Association of Certified Fraud Examiners have a triangle, and they talk about there are three things that cause fraud, and all of those came true with Eddie. Number one. There's a you need a financial need. Now you and I want to make more money, even though you you won the lottery. I had a great job. I, I made the money I wanted to make. You know, at some point, if you go through a divorce, you, alcoholism, gambling, all of those, you get an urge. I gotta get more money. You know, credit card debt. Uh, but you need the second and third piece of that triangle, and the second one is opportunity. Opportunity mm-hmm. means that if you write the checks and you write the POs and no one's overseeing it, you can sign the check and spend the money. You're right for thinking about now that you got a financial need, I better do, I'm going to do this. Heck with it. And, and that's one you want to take away the opportunity. The third one is, is rationale. What time 
many of us have the authority as a CEO to write checks to, yeah, I might have a financial need, but at what point does the little rationale devil over here saying you deserve it? And that's kind of what, Eddie, you know, in his, in his proffer, Eddie said, you know, I was worked too hard. We were a real small organization. No, we didn't have the checks and balances. I saw the opportunity. I, I, I programmed it. I compiled it. I oversaw it. So I had the opportunity and the rationale was they're working me too hard. I deserved more money. Joe over there was making more money than me. And so when those three combine, mm -hmm. as it did here, you have it. And I tell organizations when I go out and speak now, I do a lot of public speaking. I use Eddie's as a back a story as a background, but um, it really is to try to help financial institutions, any institution, talk about, you know, outside hackers are a big threat, but internal fraud is also big. And and why it's important to have a policy. I hate policy and procedures as a CEO, but policy and procedures just to say when somebody's hired, if you steal, you may be prosecuted. We may, you know, we call the police just so you have that little devil saying, oh, I better not do that. That's part of that rationale. That's how you take that out as a CEO. Um, there was a there was a business manager in a county organization, and the county said, We're, we don't have enough money. Let, why don't we see if the county next door will allow you to be the business manager in both? And so they did. And this lady uh, was a business manager doing well. But in the one county, there was a crusty old guy, probably looked like me, looked back and said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, never looked at the agenda or, or any of the action items, but would always say, you ain't stealing, are you? And uh, uh, he would say that about every other meeting. Although he never did any work with what he was doing, but she stole two to three hundred thousand dollars. But she didn't steal it from the county where the old guy complaining was. She was from the other because we believe her rationale was there's somebody overseeing this. So every once in a while, saying, "Hey, we got an audit coming in," or "Hey, uh, I, I when the auditor does come in, say I'd like to have you check this because it just doesn't feel right." Uh, is very important in an organization because you don't want to go through what we went through. It is not fun mentally uh, and. You don't want it because you could ruin your reputation and ruin your business. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people that are that are watching or listening to this are lottery players, people that are that are hoping to win the lottery. Do you have what is your advice for them? As a lottery director, uh, you know, you, I could I could have doubled the revenue real fast. But you always want to make sure you're not over promoting, over promising, which means that you as, as a player. Um, in any kind of gaming, I learned very quickly, play with not, with your head, not above your head. If you're going to play the lottery or you're going to play gambling of any kind, take a certain amount of dollars and call it entertainment money. Spend it, but don't reach back in your pocket if you lose and say, oh, I know I can win. It's fun to play. It's fun to really fun to dream with the Powerballs and Mega Millions. It's fun to play. And, and you know, if, if you like scratch tickets... Play with just a certain amount of dollars, and if you win, you're ahead of the game, right? Um, and and I I when I play scratch tickets, I just buy ten of the same ticket. If I have fifty dollars, ten into fifty is five dollars. I'll buy ten five dollar tickets. I'll probably win one, but I probably won't win my money back. The odds will say I won't win my money back, but I can strut around and say I won. But if I win a little bit, I don't just say I'm going to go spend another fifty bucks right away. So. Uh, play with some money, call it entertainment money, you're done, have a great time with it. You do that whether you're at the craps table or whether you're playing lottery or playing Powerball. Use pop money is, is, is another way to do it. But lotteries, on average, have between 20 and 25% profit margin. Every lottery, it's the way the games are set up. What does that mean? That means that if you spend $100 on lottery tickets, on average, the money going back out is about... Well, actually, it's about 65 to 70 percent because lotteries also have to pay the, the stores, a commission and all of the other. But prizes usually go out at about 65 to 70 percent. So it it you know, it, it isn't a guaranteed win. But when you do win, as you can, you know, you can attest to it is really fun. So, you know, when when Biden gave out all of the extra money the last two years, lotteries, gaming, gambling institutions all soared. And, you know, people got it and thought, you know, where could I invest it? And everybody's scared of the stock market. Well, can I win with it? You don't want to gamble the, your life savings on the lottery. Play with what you can lose and use it as entertainment, not as I'm going to win. And then when you don't win, well, I have to because I got to pay my kids tuition or whatever. So that that's my advice. How I play, I mentioned on scratch tickets on Powerball. 
now that I can play, I've won, and or I'm not won. I, I did win. Here's what I've won. I've been playing, and I won four dollars three dollars ago. Hmm. Well, congratulations. You... <laughs> yeah, I'd like to win what you won. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it but is on possible. On the other hand, I'm proud of what you've won. I mean, that's it. It is truly luck, and it's life changing. But you have a second decision once you win that big one of how do I maximize keeping the dollar so I have it for the rest of my life, and if you have family, for my family. That's why I think it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to get a financial advisor early on. The average person that wins the lottery does not know what to do with that that kind of money. They don't have an education or a background in that. So I that's one of my highest suggestions for people if they do win. Hundred percent right. If you didn't if you didn't know how to handle the money beforehand, if you didn't have much money and you were almost broke, you probably can't handle it when you do get it. Mm hmm. What what's your opinion on I, I've met and interviewed quite a few lottery winners and obviously lived that life myself, but a lot of people I've found that it tends to magnify their personality and people say this, but what, do you have an opinion on that? Of people that do win? Uh, magnify may be right because our latest winner uh, that I gave away the, the biggest jackpot uh, dollars to actually went the opposite way. She was quiet and shy to begin with. And when we counseled her and talked to her, said, look, Let's do the press conference. Let's do it. And then just say, I've already done mine and I'm off and realized how to spend her money. Haven't heard or seen from her since. So I think the the Jack Whitaker did the, exactly the opposite. Kind of like if you win in Vegas, big time, you want a big uh, crap table deal. Everybody drinks around and do all that. Some people will do that and other people will will, uh, will know how to walk away. So I, I think it amplifies it, but it depends what your personality was beforehand. Mm hmm. And that and that winner that you awarded to was three hundred and forty nine or three hundred and forty yeah, three point nine three to four hundred million dollars. Right. And and even the one before that, uh, you know, they publicly stated that they were that they had the financial plan. I mean, I think they said that they were close to being broke, but they put together the team and put a third to charity. So they had tax write offs. So they didn't have to give as much to, you know, you don't you want to give it away right away while you're getting your income rather than waiting two or three years to give it away to a charity, uh, you know, set up deals for their kids, set up stuff for them and they're going to be comfortable for life. And again, they're, it's pretty darn quiet in, in what they do and what, when you see them, they're just as fun loving as they were before. But everybody, I, I, I am in a breakfast club with a lot of million, a couple billionaires and, and they all, when they get up and talk about their pluses and minuses, they'll always say, well, you know, but this business was fun, but I almost went under two or three times. And then they'll say, you know, Johnny's in Yale and Susie in Harvard and Peggy, well, trying to find herself. Yeah, everybody's got their own problems. Money won't solve it all for sure. Yes. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't solve all problems. It can, it can be very positive though, depending upon what you do with it. But you have, for, you have overcome the, the odds. I don't know if you, you would frame it that way, but you have done some pretty remarkable things. You took the local zoo there in Iowa, Blank Park Zoo, from a pro profitability from a $600,000 deficit, I was reading, uh, to the second largest attended attraction in the state. You've become a successful author and entrepreneur. So you, you have done these wonderful, wonderful things. So what's your advice for someone, anyone watching this video that might want to that are they want to achieve their own dreams like how should someone go think, about pursuing yeah. their own dreams uh, i get asked often if i was 21 again what what would i recommend you know if they're 21 what would i recommend if i was back at 21 again i said two things one in any business raise your hand and if you want to start your own business uh, you, you you raise your hand you learn a business the boss will always recognize you when you want to you'll clean the toilet when the janitor doesn't show up nobody else wants to do it so volunteering for as much as you can and learning as much as you can before you start that business so that you've got a basis of money. And then you take a portion of that money and work nights and weekends on your new project, on your new business. And I did that every time I was successful with any company that I had. I always took a portion of it. And, and Procter and & Gamble would call it research and development. I called it my play money. And you could either go gamble it on the lottery or on gaming. Uh, but I, I gambled it on new ideas and trying to do new businesses. So... I was lucky enough to start in the cable television world. All my buddies were in broadcast, and it was really fun, really entrepreneur and really successful. It was a big a company that grew to a big New York Stock Exchange company. We all got stock options. Problem was, my dad told me when you grow up, get a job, work hard, 
at 62, you'll be happy. And I realized at age 40, I had everything I wanted. So happiness doesn't happen when you hit a goal. Happiness happens on the way to success. And all the things that I've learned, hmm. then starting my own companies, doing the same thing, taking a portion of profits and looking for that next new idea. Uh, until I was 50, I said, I, I just, I'm done. I've, I've worked it hard. I'm going to retire, do something different. And that's when I got the call on the zoo. They were losing money. Uh, and uh, went in and used those same techniques we learned entrepreneurship uh, from that cable company and then running my own business and starting four or five companies to uh, get the zoo turned around and get a profitability and an endowment so it'll be around forever back to saving money so that just put if you put money into operations or your daily life and that's all you have you aren't going to be happy down the road because you're not going to have the money so you got to get an endowment a retirement the 401k everything i could do to put it away was important and uh, after we got that turned around, the call from the governor came, said the lottery director resigned. Would you be? And again, you can tell I love marketing and promotion more than I ever liked to be in a fraud buster in, in the lottery business. And so that's mm. fun. And now it's the ultimate retirement job is I'm speaking all over the world, uh, talking about ethics, fraud with the lottery case, and also coming up with new ideas, new ideas. And that's what the, why I did the two books, not so much to make money on the books, but to have fun with the speeches where they pay me to go in. And then I look around anywhere I'm at in the world and see the world on their dime. And what a, what a fun retirement and do things like this, Timothy, this is fun and talking and looking back. Cause I'd heard your story. I wasn't around when you, when you won your lottery win, but uh, hearing the story and seeing the success you're having now, that's the rewarding part of the whole, whole process. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. For, for people that are watching this or listening that, that do play the lottery, a lot of people are curious, do you have a better chance of, should people be buying a quick pick, computer generated quick pick, or choose your own numbers? That's one question. And, and second to that is, should you choose the, the cash option or the annuity now, today, in your opinion? Perfect. The two most asked questions about lottery winners. Let's go back to picking your own numbers versus quick pick. Here's my rationale of what I know. One is about 80% of the people let the computers quick pick, right? About 20% play their birthdays, anniversaries, or their lucky numbers. Guess what? 80% of the wins are from quick picks, and 20% are from exactly the same percentage. So it doesn't make a difference. That, that truly, it's what you feel comfortable with and what you feel lucky with. I mean, that's part of what, we're, what, we're, what the lottery is and why people play is hoping for that luck and trying different ways. So some people say, oh, I play my own numbers. I have one more doing that. It's it's almost exactly, uh, it is exactly the same. And that's pretty good news for those who want to play the lottery because that means that it is fair and honest. Any numbers you take, you have an equal chance to win. The second one was, should I take the cash or would I take the annuity if I won? Now that I'm out of it, now that I know what I know. If you don't handle money, we said you probably won't handle money very well afterwards. So you might want to take the annuity. I, I wouldn't take the annuity from the lottery because the lotteries can't afford to lose. If somebody has an annuity to, to let that annuity go under. So they buy really, really, really conservative, low interest uh, annuities to be able to, 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 to pay it back. So what I would do is take the cash. I would find the financial planner, find the, the lawyer, and I would uh, find every way to get rid of as much tax as I can. And then I would take that and buy an annuity that has a little higher interest rates, not a real risky one, but has higher interest rates, and then put that aside, and I would get a much better return than I would on the annuitized. And knowing that I couldn't touch, I can only touch so much each of the 20 or 30 years, however far out you want to put it, with your financial advisor to do that. So uh, I, I wouldn't take the annuity from the lottery, not because they're not nice people, but because they will really give you a conservative one, you can make more money if you just do a kind of conservative one on your own. Hmm. That that sounds like excellent advice. And do any do any wins stick out to you? For for I've seen you holding, or, you know, awarding these giant checks to people, hundreds of millions of dollars. But do any stick out to you as being the craziest or most notable, or any stories you want to share? <laughs> Uh, I remember, I mean, the, the big ones are always fun just because all the press and everything that go around it, you're just trying to make sure that you don't mess anything up when you're standing in front of the national, international media at the time. But the one that I remember, I mean, you really get some crazy stories of, of winners and, 
every winter that is, if it's kind of crazy, you've got to have security check it out before you give the money out. You got to make sure somebody didn't steal the ticket or they lost whatever. My favorite one was uh, someone came in uh, with a ticket and it had two signatures on it. And our security immediately says, no, it should only have one. Who really has this? We want to hear the story. And the story was that um, there was a lady who was a drug dealer, uh, a heavy user, and was put in jail. Uh, she had a boyfriend and she had a child with that with that boyfriend. So the boyfriend decided that after she was in jail for a while, he may not want to take care of not his child anymore. Um, so he, his cousin said, well, geez, I'd love to adopt a baby. I'll adopt the baby, adopted the baby. And about 10 years later, the lady's still in prison. The mom's still in prison. The child is now 10 years old or 10 or 12, somewhere in there has a birthday. And so the, uh, lady who's a cousin said, okay, let's have a birthday party. And just to be nice, invited the boyfriend of the lady in jail or in prison to come and he, he had a new girlfriend by now and they were going to go to the party. They needed to buy the kids something. Uh, they stopped in for, I don't know what they stopped in the convenience store to get, but they decided to buy a lottery ticket to give to the kid. So they bought the lottery ticket, gave to the kid, which you can do in our state. Uh, you have to be 21 to buy the ticket, but you can gift it to anybody. What was this uh, a scratch the, ticket or a, a, it was, I believe it was a scratch ticket. Kid opens it up. You know, okay, scratches it, $100,000 winner. Immediately, the girlfriend of the boyfriend of the lady in prison grabs it, signs it, but the custodian cousin said, wait a minute, no, this is his, you gave it to him, and she signs it, and the lady who bought it in the convenience store that was the girlfriend of the boyfriend of the lady in prison <laughs> says, no, the, the deal was, we said if we won that we'd split it with him. And a lawsuit ensues. And ultimately, I think they settled out of court because uh, we just said we're not paying it. We're going to let a judge decide it. We're not going to be the bad people here. A judge decided. And they ultimately settled out of court. I believe that the kid got 90% in an, in an education fund for college and hmm. the other folks who bought it got 10% and everybody's happy. So, I mean, you get a lot of those each day. You get You get some just crazy hmm. stuff. We have the same thing. Somebody had one that was signed by two people. Because the lady who bought it should have won it, said it's mine. Uh, her boyfriend, her husband said, "Yeah, but we need to go down and we need to give. We want to give some money to someone who's getting out of the service, and we need to give them the money. But we're leaving. You go cash it." So they did had double signatures. So we called them in, talked to them, heard the story, and said, "Yeah, you know, good luck. Tell them thanks for his service." So, wow. you, you know, our security folks were phenomenal. Almost all security are past officers of the law, and they really do a good job because, above all, we want to make sure those games are fair and honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I know we're running kind of short on time here, but you mentioned earlier that there are usually cameras and, and audio sometimes with people that purchase these huge winning tickets. Do, do lottery officials have an idea who has won before the public? Absolutely. So any any big big jackpot or anything that's screwy, uh, all, all lotteries have agreements with the convenience stores that we can see and use their video. Um, so we just go in and ask, and we call their security officers, and they usually we say here's you know we know to the second of when something hits, and if you have a ticket and you check it, it automatically registers that, and you're probably on camera. So. A little advice, if you're ever going into a convenience store to steal a candy bar or steal anything, don't because you're probably on camera today. And uh, we have full access to all that. So when somebody came in, and that's that's why we busted the Eddie Tipton case. Even back then, we knew it was a rather large gentleman who sounded as if he was in his 30s or 40s, although his face was kind of covered. And he was a rather large gentleman. And the person who called to say it was me, we basically said that the lady in public relations said, Okay, what were you wearing? He said, I was wearing tweed pants and a sports coat. He said, nope, that's mm -hmm. not it. Or somebody called and said it was, you know, down the road when people were trying to falsely claim, a lady would call and say, hey, I bought it. We'd say, nope, because over here uh, on the tape, we knew that it was a man. So we could discount everybody else until this guy called and gave us the right serial numbers. And there's so many security features on those papers. It's just, just amazing. There was recently a 
lottery win in the Philippines, which struck headlines in the media where there was, I believe it was over a hundred people at least that won on, on a draw. And I know that's not in the United States. It's nothing that it's a completely different game, but all these people won on a single night, really, really defying the odds. Are, are you familiar with that story? And if so, do you have an opinion about it? Anytime something goes outside the odds, there's an investigation. And, uh, I, I, you know, having a lot of people win on one, there, there was one where um, people would, in scratch tickets, they'd look for packets they'd, online. Most lotteries show how many jackpots or the top prize is still out there. And if not many tickets are left out there, someone will go out and try to buy all those. There's always a scheme in doing that. As a marketer, I kind of am excited that someone would stand up in any of these and say, hey, I know how to rig the lottery because more people then try it and you sell more tickets and you make more money for the state. But uh, there have been a couple, three attempts where the programming is a little bit off or it's just plain luck. Somebody loves playing certain numbers and they buy those numbers two or three times over on the smaller lotto games. And when they hit one, they hit it big. But you'll almost always find, I think there was one in Michigan recently that, I mean, he was he, he had won a big five, six, seven million dollar and he kept playing, then he'd win more. If you play a lot of money, you probably will win. But remember, the lottery always has a 25 percent margin. So he probably played more than what he ever won. But all you ever hear about is his winnings. And that's the way a lot of people play in Vegas, too. Oh, yeah, I won. I won money this weekend. Yeah. How much did you put in? So that's usually the realm. But. When, when those things happen, you you almost guaranteed somebody's going in and reevaluating and doing it. If you feel something's wrong, call your security office at the lottery because they'll investigate anything and everything because the number one goal is safety and security. Because if somebody does find a way to get in and bust it, that's going to cost them a lot more money than the time and effort it'll take to investigate and, and get things corrected. This is Terry Rich. He's the author of $80 Billion Gamble, Dare to Dream, and Dare to Act. We will put links to these books below as well as his website. But we are running kind of short on time. But Terry, is there is there anything else that you wanted to say today that, that I don't know enough to ask or that you just wanted to, to say? Um, lotteries are fun. Play with your head and not above your head. Uh, I guess there's a saying that a lot of lotteries use. Uh, but... Darn it, I hope you all win and have the smile that Timothy has here after winning and, and after life. It's it's obviously a whirlwind for the year after you win, but uh, when it's all said and done, you know, people say, oh, you know, I lost, so I'm helping out education. No, everybody that plays, you want to win first and foremost, and and uh, we, we would want you to win if you're going to play. There's no doubt about that, or you wouldn't play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, and people actually actually do win, and uh, it's well. I really, really appreciate your time, Terry. Your, your what you have been through, your experience, and your your books look extremely intriguing as well. We will put links to all of these below. But thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure to meet you here today. It was fun. Thank you so much. So that was my interview with Terry Rich. If you liked this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Let me know in the comments what did you think of this interview and what will you do if and when you win the lottery jackpot, because it is possible if you play. There are new videos and interviews coming soon on this channel. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when they come out. As always, thank you so much for watching, and thank you for your support.